So back in the summer of 2013, I had just graduated from high school. I was 18, super stoked to be out of school, but also just really anxious. As somebody who never really cared to try to get the best grades in school and made no real plans for what I was about to do now, I ended up just pretty depressed and got a job at a local Dollar General to start trying to make some quick cash. Growing up here in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, I didn't really share a lot of interest with my locals like horse racing, bad politics, and hard drugs. I dove into video games, movies, and TV to try and fill my time that wasn't spent working at the dumpster that is Dollar General. I was also slowly starting to get back into anime after not really watching it since the Nami Dragon Ball Z days as a kid, with things like Full Metal Alchemist and Attack on Titan. I figured, well, I've got an income now, maybe I should check out a streaming service. All I had to use at the time was a PS4, so I decided to check out the streaming options it had to download. And after checking through those options, I decided to take a shot with Crunchyroll. After entering all the info and making an account, I started to browse its full catalog, which at the time was like, wow, this is, this is a lot. Hunter x Hunter was a series I was interested in, and at the time the 2011 anime was still going hard. Naruto, Bleach, and One Piece too, and I could finally see if they lived up to their legendary reputations. I scrolled through series after series of all this non-stop anime that I'd never heard of, and then came across this. I looked at the box art for this series, Toriko, and immediately thought, like pretty much everyone else, blue-haired Goku? No, 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 not this one. This was before they threw Goku in the Sherman Wilderness. I looked below and read the description talking about gourmet hunters in a world where food and taste and texture rule, and thought, eh, sure, why not? Sounds fun. And started the first episode. Or second, technically, but th hang on to that. The opening theme by my man Akira Kushida started to play, the guitar riff kicked, and I got mad hype, man, and yeah, I'd play more of the OP, but you know how it goes on YouTube. Toei's probably already on the way here to put me down after just 5 seconds of audio. So for this video, I'm going to be talking about Kuriko's manga. Mostly. I will be talking about the anime a little bit, like it is what got me into the series and it is important in the grand scheme of things, but for really super not great reasons, I'm not going to be really talking about it in too much of a positive light. I'll also be going out of my way to avoid any actual story spoilers, but in talking about elements of the world and the characters and aspects of the cancellation of the series, little bits of info are probably going to come up, and for that reason, I'll put the thing up on the screen that lets you know beforehand where to skip if you ain't trying to see all that. All that out of the way, sit back, grab you a snack, show appreciation for the snack, and let's talk about some Toriko. Toriko is a series written by Mitsutoshi Shimabakuro, who was first known for a series in Shonen Jump that ran from 1997 to 2002 known as Sekimatsu Leader Den Takeshi, or Tale of a Leader in the End of the Century Takeshi. While never hitting critical highs in popularity globally, it did win the Shogakukan Children's Award in 2001, being consistently popular with children throughout its entire run. In 2002, the manga was abruptly canceled due to super bad starring Jonah Hill and Michael Sarah, not good reasons that I didn't know about it until I'd already finished the series twice and become more active on Twitter in 2016. It's still a super hot topic online, so for this video, I won't be talking about him anymore, and honestly, for all I really care, Hatsune Miku wrote Kuriko. Thanks for the help, Queen. During this time, a one-shot was published in 2002 for Kuriko that ran in an issue of Shonen Jump. Japan dug it. In the year 2007, another one-shot for the same Toriko series from 2002 ran in another issue. It used the same characters, but this time had a slightly more narrative-focused plot. Japan still dug it. Being just as well received as the initial one-shot for both its fun character designs and the weird and interesting food-based world, it was picked up by Shonen Jump and ran from 2008 to November of 2016, with the majority of its run being used for heavy marketing for the magazine itself to try and fill someone else's shoes to really, really mix results, but just, just hold your horses there, we'll get to that bag of ants later. Toriko focuses on the big guy himself, Toriko, a gourmet hunter, and his personal chef, partner, and best friend, Komatsu. In this world, everything is food, and if it isn't food, it's probably at least based on food. From plants to animals, sports to television, religion to government, and even war and peace itself, this world's lifeblood is food. And in this world of food, a gourmet hunter like Toriko isn't uncommon at all. Hunters roam around this vast world looking for both good food and good times. There's giant stalks of vegetable roots that stretch high up into the sky, mixing with the air from higher atmospheres to create giant exotic gardens of vegetables in the clouds. 
A soup made from hundreds of thousands of extinct ingredients, distilled to the perfect essence of literally transparent, pure flavor. Giant lions who cry sparkling soda like Coke or Pepsi, and depending on how or why they're crying, it's flavored completely differently due to the mixed emotions and can have a more enjoyable flavor like Dr. Pepper. Kariko was the man who hunts it all down for both himself and for the world to enjoy, using his signature spike punch and fork and knife attacks. It, don't, don't worry, the fighting's getting its own section later because, yeah, it's a big deal. This is where my boy Komatsu comes in, the chef with a touch of gold that makes Gordon Ramsay look like a stupid oh, bitch. <laughs> that is stupid. Like Toriko, in this world of food, Komatsu plays just as hugely of an important role. Where it's up to Toriko to hunt the food down and to take the danger face first, it's up to Komatsu to follow behind and to take that food Toriko captures, pulling some mad scientist ass experimenting and discovering new and delicious ways to prepare their meals. So if Toriko finds a plate of french fries from like a potato fountain or if it's on the back of a potato rat, Komatsu's role is to come in with some of the previously captured goods and to spice up those fries to the next level. With this hunter-chef pairing, they explore the world with the ultimate goal of eating some good-ass food to fill Toriko's never-ending appetite. When you see those shonen protag who can eat the most food posts on Twitter, the answer is always Toriko, even if no one out here is putting any respect on his name anymore. Outside of just eating the food that they find, all hunters have the life goal of filling out their full course menu, a listing of gourmet hunters' favorite items that they personally captured. This list is made up of an hors d'oeuvre, a soup, a fish dish, a meat dish, a main course, a salad, a dessert, and lastly, a drink. This full course menu that each hunter wants to complete is mostly for themselves as a personal goal, but also in a way serves as a bragging right and a little bit of an implication on each hunter's personality. A poison gourmet hunter's list will be full of poisonous foods, a drunk dude's list will be full of booze related foods, and someone who's real beautiful's list will be full of like tiramisu and macaroons I guess, I don't know, I'm not beautiful. This list also proves that you've hunted down a possibly legendary food, letting you flex a little bit on other hunters. Each plant, animal, or food based item is given a capture level, which on one hand is basically just your generic anime power scaling system, but on the other is actually a really smart piece of world building. The bigger the capture level, the tougher the challenge for the food, and usually the more bomb ass of a reward. You'd think a higher capture level would mean the item in question would be much stronger, right? Well, in this world, that ain't always the case, Watson. Two examples. First up, let's look at the surprise apple here. It's an apple that's taste and value completely change based on how surprised it is. The bigger the scare you give, the better the reward. But if you go too far and ass blast the little guy, you'll surprise them literally to death and ruin the flavor. Vice versa, the opposite applies if you can't surprise them at all. No level ups, no big bucks. Example 2 here we have the ozone herb, a super special plant that if you try and peel back at shell, uh oh dummy you rotted it instantly. It's through trial and error that you realize you need to pull back two of its shells at the exact same time in perfect sync, finally letting you access that big gushy boy inside. Yeah, I will say the capture levels definitely feel like an excuse to put a number on power after a certain point in the series, but it definitely adds credibility to the world in a sense that everything has to be ranked, and it must be ranked correctly, because hunting for food in this world is the most important event, and hunting out of your range would just be a senseless death at the hands of bigger and bigger creatures. And of course, with the bigger the creatures, the bigger the fights will have to become. And when it comes to fighting, that's where Kariko delivers. takes heavy influence from series like Fist of the North Star, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Parts 1 and 2, and Dragon Ball Z, with many of its characters being like the dictionary definition of muscle and mass itself. While these characters definitely give off the feeling of strength and a raw sense like some Baki villain, Kuriko also draws in aspects from a series like One Piece and the ideas of having characters that stretch realism and get a little wild. But I wouldn't go as far as to compare them to like hyper specific powers with rules like men or stand abilities. Like I mentioned earlier, Kuriko's Kamehameha main character attack is the spiked punch, a blow in which he builds up power in his arm and delivers a punch so hard and fast that after the hit, there is a second delayed impact. As the series goes on, you see the punch itself increase in impacts, delivering devastating blows and creating a fun sense of motion in the action as enemies feel blast after blast from his hit. Just to gush for a second, this move is one of my most favorite main character moves probably like 
ever. The nature of it being a hit for hit impact attack that lasts after the initial punch like Toriko is the goddamn big O or something, it makes for an insane fluidity to attacks that are incredibly fun to watch from page to page, where you can just count the number of hits Toriko has folded in with each punch play out over a chapter. He also has moves such as Fork, an ability to turn his hand claw-like to pierce and hold his prey in place, and Knife, a follow-up to his Fork attack where he cuts his prey down, preparing them to be his next meal. This is all made possible through the power of Gourmet Cells, which basically function as the chakra or key of this manga. Gourmet Cells are cells in a gourmet hunter's body that expand and grow in reaction to tasting new and delicious foods, because of course that's how they power up, what else did you expect by now? This adds an extra layer on top of the hunt for new foods because not only is the food itself a reward, the buff boys get even buffer. Some foods react differently to a different hunter's cells, so finding that certain special food that mixes perfectly with each hunter can have wild results. Outside of Toriko himself and his fighting style, you have characters whose abilities are both varied and, of course, based in food. These abilities are fueled by a person's gourmet cells, which means that different people with different cells have varying abilities. The real variety and fun of the fight start to shine when we look at the abilities of individual characters and seeing how they somehow, sometimes real loosely, tie back into food. Abilities like using your cellular energy to manifest a giant pair of chopsticks to both attack an enemy and defend yourself, crushing them under the weight of traditional Japanese technology. All the way to immensely powerful villains whose tongue can twist and turn, potentially devouring you or literally anything else, with a single whip, down to the atoms of the space you once stood in. It can also flex, which makes me feel really weird. There's also universal styles like knocking, which is a term for using biodegradable needles mixed with pinpoint martial arts to attack pressure points in someone or something's body to either disable them or knocking your own pressure points for a massive boost in power, if only temporary. It can be done by both special tools like the needles or even by hand if you really know what you're doing. Knocking is very important to a good boy hunter because it allows them to subdue any animal that they don't have any interest in eating. Killing an animal and not eating it is wasteful and ungrateful in this world, but I'll talk more on that later. Next up, we got Intimidation, which is using both your natural instincts and the gourmet cells flowing through your body to call upon the inner food demon resting inside yourself to literally scare the enemy frozen or possibly even to death. When someone uses this technique, the cells inside are able to project the image of fear that you want to send, subduing animals, mentally attacking enemies, or just proving that you were the goddamn strong and whoever is in your way needs to shut the hell up and move, causing both physical and mental damage. There's just a certain flow and joy to the way fights play out in Toriko. While it does come across at first as just meatheads who are ridiculously buff beating the hell out of each other, when you add in the power system of the characters, the fights ebb and flow between brawls of technique and all-out battles of pure raw strength, and the art goes miles to convey both the impact, fluidity, and creativity in almost every single fight. While the abilities can sometimes get world-altering, they're always grounded in the characters' love for food in one way or another, and the passion of the concept shines like really brightly due to it. Combining these concepts of both shonen style abilities and heavy food influence, it creates a world of deadly fighting where the reward that hangs in the balance is the control of flow of food in the entire known world. Also, real quick before I move on, I just want to say that between Ichiryu, Setsuno, Midora, Jiro, and a really long list, Toriko absolutely has the most badass elderly cast in any manga that I can think of in the moment. It's like, what if every single old person was just Yamamoto level from Bleach? It's insane. So I mentioned a little earlier that the governments, religions, and peace itself in this world were all founded in its relationship with food. And in that, I want to focus for a minute specifically on the religious aspect of the world. In Toriko, the phrases Itadaki Masu and Gochiso Sama Deshita are ones that are used a lot in universe, with Itadaki Masu being what you say as you begin your meal and can usually translate to thank you for the meal, and Gochiso Sama Deshita is your compliments to the chef, translating to it was a feast. But this concept stretches further than both just the idea of saying thank you for the food in both the series and in Japanese culture itself. The roots of the expressions are found in Buddhism, with the appreciation you show for your meal stretching past just the person who prepared it, but also showing deep gratitude for the farmers who grew the vegetables, the animals who gave their lives to continue the life of another, down to the very earth itself for providing the food that's keeping you alive right now. 
Finally, after the meal, you show your thanks to the person who prepared it by thanking them for the feast. Doing so shows gratitude for their work and their skill. So basically, tip your waiters and waitresses, they, they really deserve it, especially in hell year 2021. In Toriko, a world where food is God itself, one who is the most appreciative, the most humble towards the bounty that the world itself gives you, the one with the most food on her, is the one who is closest to God. One who has lowered himself in both respects and honors the food from every single cell in their body is rewarded by the food. The light of God or the food shines down upon you and you in a sense become one with the world and you learn truly what it means to be thankful and how to fully honor the food. And honestly, I think there's something really like wholesome and interesting in that. We all eat food to survive. We eat to live, but we live to eat. And in this world where food is king, the concept of respecting the food down to the dirt it can grow from, the water that nurtured it, the food it may have consumed itself to survive, it's what matters most, showing gratitude for that beautiful bounty that's out there in the world. And by doing so, you're rewarded with everything the world has to offer you. And I know it's kind of odd to say, but this exact concept in a manga aimed towards young kids about showing unrelenting gratitude for what the world had given me was a bright light that I'd really needed in that slump from graduating high school. I mean, yeah, things were scary, and the future was uncertain, and Dollar General sucked, but this goofy show about two pals just hunting for food together showed me genuine fun, and gave me a more genuine respect for the world that I live in and everything it gives me to experience and to enjoy. So all this is to say that at the end of the day, Toriko taught me about gratitude. And with that gratitude, I want to talk a little bit about the ending of Toriko. No, no, not the end of the story, but the ending of the manga itself. Once you finish the manga, you're definitely left with the feeling of, yeah, this shit was cut short. Not only due to the ending of the story being rather abrupt, but the little small things in the last chapters. You could tell there was still a lot of life left to be written down on those pages. But, as most of you probably already know, the weekly march of Shonen Jump is ruthless. It can replace a brand new series that's just getting its feet off the ground, or your personal beloved series that's reigned for years now, in a moment's notice. And in that regard, I always feel like the deck was stacked a bit unfairly for Toriko. Its start and jump was almost immediately pushed to the forefront, with marketing tricks like asking its younger readers to design monster concepts for the series, and when they were used, you got a nice little shout out somewhere on the page. The year after its release, it received an OVA by UFO Table, the studio a lot of you probably know now for Demon Slayer. It's honestly not that bad, super worth a watch. And it received a sequel to that the next year. Shortly after that, in 2011, it received an anime adaptation by Toei, with its first real episode technically being a short adventure with Toriko and Luffy together. It's not that great, don't recommend it. The anime itself wasn't really too bad starting off, but quickly started to show signs of poor pacing, lots of filler, and pretty heavy censorship due to its 9am time slot that was aimed at literal babies. Not only was the series marketed heavy from the early beginning, it was marketed as something that could stand next to two of the big three, that being the now famous early 2000s to mid 2010s run of One Piece, Naruto, and Bleach that consistently drew record numbers for the magazine, which, bitch, if you're watching this video, you, you more than likely already know about that anyway. Toriko shared a lot of covers with Luffy and Naruto, right in the front and center of many of them. It got more animated specials that featured both Luffy and Goku, so now it was worth even being crossed over with Dragon Ball Z in the eyes of marketing. With all this groundswell of covers, cross-series marketing, and even fan campaigns, it really started to push this narrative that Toriko was going to be the next member of the Big Three, effectively trying to replace Bleach, which honestly was appearing on covers in the forefront less and less. For me, personally, I've always thought that the timing was what was key for this really odd change in things. So during this time for Bleach, Taite Kubo has recently expressed that he was losing a little bit of his interest in drawing the manga, as well as having declining health at the time from focusing so much of his life on the series, and honestly was probably wanting to be done with it sooner rather than later. This situation, mixed with the rising popularity of Toriko, probably just left Jump in a position of, well, market this one harder and get them numbers up in case Kubo wants out, just, just push Bleach in the back for now. Not declining interest moving it or bad editor-artist relations, 
just Shonen Jump trying to cover their ass in case Kubo pulled a Kubo and said, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me because he's a king and you can't stop him. The aggressive marketing actually worked for the most part at first, especially during the manga's cooking festival arc, where Toriko was one of the top series weekly for a few months right there next to One Piece. But after a while, things changed big bad. Due to the anime adaptation being poorly received from everything to excessive censorship during some of the most important moments in the series, filler, really really bad animation in a majority of the episodes, and a straight up dumpster of an anime only ending, it was panned by pretty much everyone. Fair to mention though, this was around 2014 Toei which was really famous for looking really not great but I digress. This, mixed with the constant push for popularity and the narrative in the air that Jump wanted Toriko to replace Ichigo as one of the Jump mainstays, a lot of distaste grew for the series. It never hit those highs of the cooking festival again, and a lot of fans of Bleach just felt slighted that this series was replacing theirs. Even though some had that mindset, Toriko ended just a few short months after Bleach, in November of 2016, with a pretty rushed end of its own so it's hard to say if that mindset was correct or not. Its final chapter in Jump barely got the bottom corner of the cover to itself, but to be totally fair, that's not uncommon at all. Hell, Haikyuu just ended after he years of success for the magazine and its final cover basically said, read One Piece, fuck you. Since 2016, Toriko has all but vanished from mainstay Jump. Doom didn't even make it into Jump Force. It's not uncommon at all for an ended series to fade to the obscure records of the magazine, but for a series that was considered by the magazine itself to stand with One Piece, Naruto, and Dragon Ball Z, it's definitely odd, which is why I'm more slightly willing to believe that it was a matter of timing for the magazine for its push for popularity, and their love for the series was at the end of the day completely dependent on other things and not much love for the actual series itself. Like I said, after finishing the story, you're left with obvious signs that it still had many big ideas to take the series direction in. You get a slight glimpse of what could have been in store, and as a big fan of the series, it hurts. You can't help but feel let down. That feeling that there should be more here but there just isn't is all you're really left with. A genuine downer on such a positive ride. Then, I hopped on over to Amazon and ordered the physical version of the last volume just to have the ending on my shelf. I read those last few chapters again and again because I was still just craving more and besides a full reread, this was the best I could do. But this time, during that reread of the ending and seeing the ideas that didn't get to pan out, I was left with a different feeling. Something I had explicitly learned from the series itself. Gratitude. Just, just pure fucking gratitude, man. Yeah, I didn't get the ending I wanted, but I'm more so just grateful that I even got to experience this series in the first place. I got a series that lifted me out of the slump I was in and taught me a little bit on how to be grateful for the things that I have in my life and how to appreciate all things, big or small. And for Toriko, this series about fighting, food, and fun, more than anything, that's what I'm left with. Pure gratitude and appreciation. So, so yeah, that's, that's the video. If you stuck around for this long, like, thanks, like, a lot, for real. Like, I've never really done anything like this. I've never written a script. I've never edited a video. I've never recorded my voice down to make anything. Everything is brand new to me, so hopefully it wasn't too painful to watch for you. Um, this channel's probably going to be focused mostly on things I just like and want to talk about. Be it anime, manga, video games, movies, doesn't really matter, I'm just gonna talk about it. So I don't really want to give myself a brand and say, yo, if you like manga and anime, here's where it'll be. Cause that might not be the only things here, so there's that. But if you do like it and want to stick around for more and I'm going to try and get better, I'm learning new stuff as time goes on, soundproofing the room as things go, I'm going to get rid of that echo, sorry about that. But yeah, so if you dig it, you know, and you want to see more stuff, stick around, hopefully you'll enjoy it. I really hope you like this, and if you did, let me know in the comments if I could do better some places, also let me know in the comments. But thanks again for sticking around, see you next time.